Good morning, Keystone Church. Welcome to Easter Sunday here this weekend. Obviously, this is a little bit different than we had anticipated for our very first Easter service, but we are so very thankful that you and your family are joining us here this weekend. In fact, this date is incredibly significant in the history for our family and for Keystone Church because it was a year ago on Easter in 2019 that we actually signed the lease for the building that we're standing in where one day we would be holding our services for Keystone. Now the irony is we're not even gathered here for Easter services, but the truth is the church has never been confined to a building. Yeah. That means we can gather and worship our risen Savior wherever. And even though we're in our living rooms here this weekend, we are still gathering as a church family and we couldn't be more grateful. We're so thankful that you guys have joined us this morning. We really, really miss you. <laughs> but we're so glad that we can gather in this way and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We hope that this message speaks life and hope to your hearts and to your families this morning. That's right. We mentioned last week our worship team was working like crazy. We had some help from friends and we were able to put together a worship set for Easter Sunday. I cannot wait. So go ahead, turn the volume up, whatever you're watching on, and let's get ready to worship Jesus here this morning. Your heart and lead me. 
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Wow, I'm so very thankful for our worship team and for worship. I just want to let you know that I love pastoring this church. And Lauren and I, we are so very proud of each and every one of you for the way that you're walking through this season. We have heard so many stories about people calling and checking in on one another and praying for each other. And I just want to let you know that is so encouraging to hear as your pastor. And here as a church family this morning, we get to celebrate what we feel is the greatest story in the history of this world, that the stone has been rolled away, the tomb is empty, and we are worshiping a risen Savior here this morning. We don't serve a God that's dead, but one that is fully alive. And even at the end of this message, we're gonna have the opportunity to go back into worship for one more song, And we've even put together a special video that we hope brings a smile to your face this Easter Sunday. But before we jump into the Word, we've got to take a vote on something. Because I know every year in our household, we all have a favorite Easter candy that we have to go get. And for me, it's easy. It's Reese's peanut butter eggs. I love those things every single Easter. So you can mark down your favorite Easter candy right now in the comments. I'd love to know. But how many of you, you could honestly say my favorite Easter candy, they're Peeps. That you have to go find Peeps somewhere around Easter. Okay, listen, if that's you and that's your choice, I want to let you know that we are praying for you right now. Because Peeps are single-handedly the most disgusting candy I have ever had in my life. And if you disagree with me, you can feel free to click on that little X at the top of your box and get off this feed. I'm I'm kidding. But I just want to let you know that I think we should approach eating Peeps this year the same way that we do with social distancing. Very simply, stay away from Peeps. That's what we got to do. That's the worst dad joke on Easter Sunday. It's corny. I had to do it. Let's just get into the word here this morning. Is that all right? As we talk through the significance of Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, what I want to do is I want to deal with a very important question that I believe hits home for faith communities, but oftentimes is one of the least talked about subjects. And the question, and really the topic that I'm referencing is spiritual doubts. And very specifically, a question that Jesus asked in Luke chapter 24, why do doubts rise in your mind? 
And it's very interesting as you dig into Scripture to see how faith and doubt can be commonly linked within the resurrection story. More on that in just a little bit. But you know, when I talk about the subject of spiritual doubts, for many of you, this maybe very simply hasn't been an issue over the years. You know, when I lived in the South, you could talk with people and, you know, their perspective was, hey, if it's in the Bible, I believe it and that settles it. And if that's where you're at, praise God for that. But I know for many people, it's just not that simple. It's not that clean. In fact, I've talked to many people over the years that it's like, Foster, I want to believe, but I'm just a little bit more skeptical in nature. In fact, the way I think through things is a little bit more analytical, and I want to believe, but I want to have some questions answered first, or I need to see some things before I believe. And I want to let you know, if that's you, I completely relate to you, because that's the way I've always been. And that might surprise you, because I'm a pastor, but even growing up at a young age, I just didn't oftentimes take things at face value. In fact, if you shared something with me here today, I might believe you, but then I'd probably take some time and go research it on my own. In fact, over the years, in our almost 17 years of marriage, Lauren and I have gotten into some arguments over this because Lauren might share something with me and she's wanting me to believe her, but she knows. She's like, Lauren, I know you don't believe me right now. Why don't you believe me? I'm your wife. I'm like, babe, I do believe you. I love you. It's not you. It's me. But I'm just going to take some time and I'm going to research this and try to figure it out for myself. And I want you to know that I believe that in this journey of faith, that there will be moments where we will be faced with a real sense of doubt. And I know that in my life, I didn't grow up in church, but I remember the exact moment that I faced this in my own life. I was a freshman in high school. I was at a student service on a Wednesday night. And I don't know why I was serving God. I love the Lord. But I was covered in this sense of doubt. And I felt like, Lord, I don't even know where this is coming from. And connected to it was also this feeling of guilt and shame. And truthfully, I think that many of us, we've had these moments, even if it was a passing thought, like, is this even real, what I believe? Are we all just doing this to make ourselves feel better? Or what if this whole God thing isn't even true? And I remember in that moment, even when I was feeling doubt in my own life, the reality is I wanted to believe. (laughs) I didn't want to feel like I did, but I didn't know how to navigate it at that particular time. But I could tell you that from my own personal worldview, when I would observe things in the world, the glory of creation... The fact that we can reproduce and eat and that everything that sustains with birth and life and death and beauty and wonder and uniqueness, I had this sense that there was probably somebody out there bigger than me, smarter than me. It just seemed as if there was someone out there that was bigger but in firm control of what was taking place. And here I am all these years later as a pastor, and I'm just letting you know that doubts come in all different shapes and sizes. And there are people that obviously they doubt the existence of God, but I do believe there are people that they'll even take it a step further and they'll say, there's no way a God could possibly exist, and you're foolish if you believe otherwise. And I think that there are others out there that they'll give God the benefit of the doubt. They'll say, you know what, yeah, there's probably some higher power and he may be out there, but he's distant from my own life. Meaning he may listen to someone else's prayers, but he surely doesn't listen to mine. And I've prayed a lot. He didn't do anything. There's no evidence to show me that he really does exist for me. And there are even others still that would say, you know what, I doubt that God could actually love a person like me because they've kept a ledger of their moral failings over the years, and they've just tried to present that to God, like God couldn't possibly forgive someone like me. In fact, I had a friend years ago that made that exact statement, said, Foster, I really do want to believe in this Jesus that you're talking about, but you have no idea what I've done. And this one is far too common that I've heard people say it where I want to believe in God, 
I want to believe in this gospel truth, but then I've met some Christians. Then I've met those that claim they follow after this God, and they're so mean, they're so hypocritical. How can I possibly believe in a God when his followers act like that? And for those of you who don't typically, you're not around church that often or church people, I just want to let you in on a little something, on a little secret you may not be aware of. That church people can oftentimes be very mean and divisive towards other church people. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. But years ago when I moved to Little Rock and started a sales job, I worked with a gentleman whose father was a Southern Baptist preacher. And I had gone to college, I studied theology, but having been from the north, I was around a lot more Catholic churches and friends of mine who were heavily involved in the Catholic church, but not so much Baptist. So I asked him, I said, hey man, what's the difference between a Southern Baptist and a free will Baptist? And it was almost immediate. He said, well, we're the ones not going to hell. I thought, oh, okay. Well, I guess that takes care of it. That's it. But some of us, we've experienced this this harshness and this sharpness when it comes to our faith in different denominations. And I believe that there's also this implied belief in the church world that if you have spiritual doubts, that means you just simply you don't have faith. And that if you have doubts, you're probably not really saved. And if you have some legitimate doubts, then you're really not following Jesus. And what I want to do today is I want to bring hope through this Resurrection Sunday, and I want to take an opposite approach. And I want to tell you that unless you actually push through some honest doubts, you'll never actually experience the depth of faith that you're craving. In fact, many people would say, well, doubt is the end of real faith. And I'm going to argue through Scripture that through, for many people, doubt is actually the beginning of a real, sincere, and grounded faith. And to do it, we're going to look at a man who was actually branded as a doubter. And his name was Thomas. He actually had a nickname, Doubting Thomas. He only had 12 verses in the Bible that talk about his life, and he's branded throughout history as a doubter. But I'm going to be honest with you, it was a false narrative. It was an inaccurate portrayal, because what I love about Thomas and the story of his life is that we're going to see that his life shows us that there's evidence that someone that is even known as one of the biggest doubters in Scripture can one day have the strongest faith. So let's look at his life, and I want to give you a little bit of this context. Jesus had just risen from the dead. He appeared to two guys on the road to Emmaus, and we pick up the story shortly after that in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 24, we're going to start in verse 36. Here's what Luke said. In verse 36, while they, the disciples, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And in verse 37, it says, they were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. I can't even imagine what it would have been like for the disciples in this moment, but of course they would have been scared. They would have been afraid. Why? Because many of them, they saw Jesus die. They were there in that moment. And then all of a sudden, they think, okay, Jesus was dead, and now we see him. He must be a ghost. But Jesus, he says to them, and he asks this big question. He says, why are you troubled? And you could almost hear the love and the compassion in his voice where he's saying, guys, really? Did you forget so quickly when I healed blind eyes, when I opened deaf ears, when I was raising the dead, when I said I would give my life and three days later I'd be back? This has always been the plan. I told you about it. It was going to happen. Did you forget it? And even when Jesus asks that question, why do doubts rise in your mind? One translation says it like this, why are your hearts filled with doubt? And then he says, look at my hands, look at my feet. It's I myself, touch and see. But what's very interesting, and you may not notice this, but guess who wasn't in the room with the disciples? Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. And how do we know? Because John's gospel tells us in John chapter 20, verse 24, it says this, Now Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came. 
He wasn't with the disciples. He wasn't with the body of believers when Jesus came. And what do we see? We see that Thomas, in essence, he missed church. He wasn't there with everyone. I'm going to be honest with you. You miss a lot when you're not in church, when you're not around a body of believers. What did Thomas miss? Thomas missed the presence of Jesus, he missed the power of Jesus, and he missed the proof of Jesus. And I know for some of us, we haven't been around church in a while. We haven't been around a body of believers, and we're missing out on the opportunity for Christ to do something in and through our life. And after all of this, the disciples, they're excited. They're communicating. They're letting Thomas know what's happening. They said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. We've been around Jesus. And I absolutely love the honesty of Thomas's response, his statement. He said this. He said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where the nails were, and unless I put my hand into his side, he says, I will not believe. Thomas is saying to the disciples, hey, listen, it might be clean. It may be simple for you, but I need more than just a secondhand faith. This issue is so important to me that I need first-hand experience with the risen Christ. And I'll be honest, I think it's one of the biggest problems, at least in American churches today, that we don't know why we believe what we believe. Many people say, well, I believe that way because that's the way my parents believe. Or perhaps I adopted that faith perspective from someone else. Or if I were even to ask some of you, how would you describe your relationship with God? The easiest way for you to answer that question would be to fill in the blank with whatever denomination you grew up around. And I'll be honest with you, I grew up around Catholic Church. My family was not Catholic. I did attend parochial school for many years of my life. And I remember when I was in those spaces, I always admired the beauty, the reverence, the tradition even though I didn't quite understand everything that was taking place. I do remember as a second grader seeing one of my friends get disciplined with a yardstick, and that's when I knew, hey, these nuns, they may look old, but they mean business. But truthfully, when it came to church, from my own personal perspective, I oftentimes felt insecure because I didn't know if I was doing the right things. Church to me very much felt like a ritualistic endeavor where I needed to follow the rules. I didn't know what a relationship with God was about, nor did I even think that the Lord wanted to be around me. You could say that I was curious, but I was not yet committed. And when you've adopted a faith perspective that's not your own and you haven't made it personal, it's only a matter of time before something happens in this life It will shake you, and then these questions will emerge, like, do I really believe this, or is it just my parents' faith? I mean, it's a big world. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of worldviews. I mean, can I really believe this narrow of a claim that Jesus is the only way? Does God really even exist? And if Jesus exists, did he really rise from the dead? Because we cannot ignore or miss the claim of the disciples. Because the claims that they made, that God so loved the world that that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin as a perfect and blameless sacrifice. That he could die in place of our sin, that he'd be made sin for us. In fact, he didn't just die for you, he died instead of you. And he claims that he didn't stay dead, that he rose from the grave, that the stone was rolled away, that the tomb is now empty. It's the whole reason that we're celebrating this weekend, that we can worship a risen Savior. And let me just be honest with you, if that is true, then it demands a response. And to me, the only reasonable response for a Savior that died for me is for me to live for Him. Here's what it says in 1 John 4, 19. We love Him because He first loved us. And Thomas is saying, this issue is so very important to me. I want to know, is this true? Because if it is true, it changes everything. Oh, well, you can't have real faith if you have doubts. No, no, listen to me. There are times that you can't have real faith unless you press through some real and sincere doubts. Doubts are not the end of real faith. In fact, for so many people, 
Doubt is the beginning of a real, solidified, rock-solid faith that will carry you on to glorify God in all that you do. And Thomas is saying, I want to believe. I just need a little bit more. And some of you, you have what it takes to believe, but you're at that place just like, I just, I want just a little bit more. And that's exactly what Jesus does for Thomas. Let's read on in John 20, verse 26. A week later, the disciples were in the house again. And catch this, Thomas was there with them. He didn't miss church for two weeks in a row. And listen, Jesus goes on to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in the room. Peace be with you. He comes through a locked door. And in verse 27, he says this, and I want you to notice it. He goes directly to Thomas. He bypasses and ignores everyone else, and he cares about the one who wants to believe. And here's what he says. He says, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And what does he say? You can hear the loving heart of Christ in this statement. Stop doubting and believe. I love it. Because Jesus gave Thomas exactly what he needed to believe. He didn't reprimand Thomas. Notice he didn't go and discipline him and say, I can't believe you. Can't believe you don't believe or you're doubting right now. You've walked with me. You've seen my miracles. What are you doing? You're not a very good Christian. No, he gave him exactly what he needed to believe. Stop doubting and believe. And I'm going to be honest. I'm believing that as a pastor, for some of you, the presence of God this Easter weekend is going to give you exactly what you need to start to believe to follow Jesus, to put your trust in Him, just like Jesus did for me, a doubter, a skeptic at heart, but I was one that wanted to believe. You know, as a student, I remember searching through the Word and leaning on Scriptures and, and, and wanting to gravitate towards things that would build my faith and of course, we've all heard John 3, 16 that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that is so very powerful. But I remember as a young person when I was hovering in doubt and wanting to believe, verse 17 stood out to me so very much which says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And this verse was so freeing for me because I thought I had to earn it. I thought it was based upon my merit, something I had to do. And this is a free gift. And the Lord changed my life through his word. And in verse 28, this is what Thomas said to Jesus. He said, my Lord and my God. Listen, in that moment, it became personal for Thomas because he wasn't just believing in Jesus, he was believing Jesus. And let me just tell you that there's a difference between believing in and believing. Because scripture even says the demons believe in Jesus and they shudder. But Thomas believed Christ, he believed the Savior, and it became personal for him. Now I'll be honest, as a pastor, my prayer, what I'm believing here this Easter Sunday, is that for many of you, something bigger than me is going to get into your heart and you're going to stop doubting and you're going to begin to believe. And for me, it was the Word of God. It was the verse in John chapter 3, 17. It was me hearing about and learning about the love of a father that was willing to send his son to die on a cross for my sins. But perhaps you're seeing what's happening in our world today and you're asking some very honest questions. What am I living for right now? Who am I living for? Is there more to life than this, to what I'm experiencing right now? What's something that I can count on that will never change, that will never shift? Where can I place my trust and build my faith? And for me, you want to talk about something that builds my faith? I want to share a couple of stories from eyewitnesses to Jesus, who they were. And you talk about building my faith. Listen to this. When I think about Peter, I think about a man that said, Jesus, I'm going to be there for you. I love you. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, no, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what happens. 
And he recognized that he denied Christ and he failed and he's filled with shame. And then after the resurrection, Jesus appears to him and says, do you love me, Peter? Peter's like, yeah, Jesus, I'm doing my best. I do love you. And then he said, feed my sheep. And Jesus forgives him. And Peter is so transformed that he preaches one of the most powerful messages in the history of the world. And 3,000 people are born into the kingdom of God in one day. And Peter becomes this rock in the faith. And when others come to Peter and they say, unless you deny your faith, we're going to take your life. And Peter says, I'm never going to deny my Lord and Savior again. I won't do it. And they said, we're going to crucify you. Just like Jesus died. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Savior was crucified. And they crucified him upside down. And the same Jesus that Peter denied was the same Jesus that Peter was willing to die for. I think about the Apostle Paul who absolutely hated Christians. And you may be watching this here this morning. You may think, well, you know what? I kind of hate Christians or I have at some point in my life. I can promise you, you haven't hated them as much as he did. He was going around killing Christians. And he had this vision and he met the risen Christ. His life was so transformed that those he hated, he became the leader of and he preached his heart out. He pointed people to Christ. He even ended up saying, for me to live and to die is gain. And when they beat him and they left him for dead, they finally tortured him and said, renounce your faith. He said, I'm never going to do it. And they beheaded him. And the one who hated Christ was now willing to die for him. I can tell you that that builds my faith. And Thomas, who's unfairly branded as a doubter, because you see, Thomas was a person of great faith. Because doubt isn't the end of faith. For many people, it's only the beginning. And once Thomas got what he needed, he traveled farther than any other disciple, going all the way to India to preach the gospel, because he so believed that they needed a relationship with the Christ that had transformed them. And when they met him early in a cave, they said, renounce your faith. He said, I'm not going to renounce my Lord and my God. And they drove a spear through his body. And the same Jesus that Thomas doubted, he was willing to die for. He believed in Jesus enough that he was willing to die for him. And so here's the question that I have for you here this Easter Sunday. I would ask you this. Do you believe in Christ enough to live for him? Do you believe enough in Christ to live for Him? Because this builds my faith. See, my faith, it's not perfect. There are moments where I have doubts just like other people. But when I press into God, when I press into who He is, He moves in a way that moves me through my doubts to a place where I remember the tomb is empty. My Savior is risen. And with billions of other people on this continent and on planet Earth, we gather together to say He's the Son of God. We believe that He's risen, that He is alive. And I'm going to be honest, some of you here this morning, you're watching and you came in with some doubts. And I'm letting you know that that's a great place to start because it's worthy of asking real questions and because doubt is not the end of real faith For many people, it's the beginning. And I believe that at this moment, there are those of you, because of the presence of God, will stop doubting and will begin to believe. You may say, well, I don't know everything. Listen, you don't need to know everything to believe something. And I'd love to give you the opportunity of how you can start. It may be something like this. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he's the son of God who can forgive me and make me new. And today by faith, I trust him and I give him my life. If you would, would you please bow your head and close your eyes with me here this morning? I'd love to pray with you. Each week at Keystone, we give this invitation. But if you're at that place here this morning where you've struggled with doubt, you've wanted to believe, I want to pray for you specifically. Lord, I just thank you for anyone that may be watching that's struggling right now with their doubts. Lord, I've been there. I've been skeptical. I've doubted your existence. I know exactly where that individual may be. 
Lord, I pray the way you did for Thomas, the way you did for so many that ended up following you, I pray that you would make yourself real in this moment. I pray that you'd help us move from a place of doubt and unbelief to a place of faith. Do what only you can do in our hearts and lives right now in Jesus' name. And I also want to give another invitation. If you've never made a decision to follow after Christ, you're at that place where you want to put your faith fully in Jesus, making a declaration to follow after Him. I'd love for you to pray this prayer with me. The Bible says when you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus, that He died for our sins, that He rose from the dead, we can have a relationship with Christ. And if that's you, I want to pray with you here this morning. Say, Jesus, right now, I give you my life. I surrender my will. I surrender my doubt. And I give myself fully to you. I commit my life to you. I say yes to you. And just like Thomas, I'm calling you Savior. I'm calling you Lord. It's becoming personal for me today. Thank you for saving me and that I can have a relationship with you. Help me to grow as I aim to walk closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Keystone. We love you guys. This service is not over yet. We do want to take a moment one last time over the next few minutes as we celebrate Christ and all He's done for us this Easter weekend. Let's worship to one last song. Then we're going to have a video as we end this weekend. But let's worship the Lord with all our heart.
Thank you, Keystone Church, for allowing us the opportunity to come into your home this weekend as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. The tomb is empty and we are truly worshiping a risen Savior. Also want to let you know, before we check out this video here this weekend, which I promise you, you're going to love, I wanted to share with you, last week I gave some details of some things that we were going to do practically in the community to serve, and I'm happy to tell you, because of your generosity, we were able to feed over 50 public works employees in Cranberry Township, as well as we were able to bless the police department, fire department, Mars Area Police Department with some food, with some snacks for them to just bless them and let them know how thankful that we are for them right now, as well as some healthcare workers that we were able to bless with some gift cards, letters of encouragement. Thank you so much for the way that you're faithfully giving towards the vision of Keystone. There's some information in this post, and we've talked about it the past few weeks, that you could give online, text to give, mailing addresses available as well. But thank you so much for helping make a difference and an impact and practically sharing the love of Christ. And I promise you're going to want to see this video from the Sincala family, which we feel is going to put a smile on your face here this Easter weekend. Yes, we love you guys so much. We miss you so much. We're giving you virtual hugs. We hope you enjoy the rest of your Resurrection Sunday. God bless. Check it out. Hey, everybody. It's Debbie. Hey, I thought I would send a video to let you know how we're doing. We've been quite busy doing puzzles and watching TV and just, you know, doing what the rest of America is doing. But I wanted to let you know how well we are and that we are fine. And here's a puzzle we've been doing. Our latest puzzle is this one that's all crayons. It was actually pretty hard. The puzzle pieces are pretty crazy. Here's our bird feed. We have a lot for the squirrels and for the birds. And we have a well-stocked cereal cabinet. We have a full kitchen. I mean, a full refrigerator. Don't judge me. It's a mess, but it's filled. And we also have a well-stocked pantry here let me see look at all this food so really all of you could come over and we could feed you for a month and so everything's really good around here and so I just wanted to say I missed you guys and I want to hug you guys I can't wait till we can be together again and see each other so until then love you all bye <laughs>